yeah, we're, we're here at Buff Max HQ in Post Falls. It's not far from me. It's like a 20 minute drive. Pretty pumped to learn the history, uh, get a tour of the factory, kind of see the insides and look under the hood. Uh, probably going to sit down and record a podcast today with maybe their marketing director, maybe even CJ Buck himself. So pretty excited. Elk shape in the house of Buck Knives uh, and talk elk hunting, of course. So where we're standing right now is uh, packing and shipping buck knives. We ship all over the world. In fact, uh, we've even shipped pallets of USA made knives to China. You can imagine that, kind of a little flip on how things work. The full length of this conveyor system here is uh, packing, pulling product, getting it packed, and getting it sent out. The guys up close here, uh, we have uh, them processing all the onesie twosie orders from the web and people who call in or come into our store and want certain things. And then down at the other end is uh, the processing for all our big customers like Bass Pro and Walmart, stuff like that. So we really do have a world-class distribution network here. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're pretty proud of the fact that we can get stuff out quickly once it's on shelf. The thing that we offer is people can go on our website, buy a knife, and have it custom engraved, either with a laser mark or with a trophy engraving. And so Jesse's gonna show us how that works. And uh, it's, you'd be surprised at some of the messages that folks wanna have on their knives. It's not just happy birthday, grandpa. A lot of times it's stuff that we, we can't use. <laughs> but that's okay. We like, we like the creativity of our customers and so uh, we'll help them out. But. Uh, all of our limited edition product gets a trophy engraved that has the serialized number on it. Say we're going to do 250, it's engraved with the number that it is, so number four of 250. Uh, we do a lot of great engraving just uh, for folks that want to have a commemorative or an item that they feel is uh, going to last them forever yeah. with their name on it. And so, uh, Jesse's got one. Oh, great, you're going to do a race night. Yes, yes. Now that I've got one more on it. Okay, so what we have here is Assembly Cell 01 Buck Knives. This is the legendary cell that's built the 110 Folding Hunter for the last 50 years. It was located in San Diego and now it's here in Post Falls. Uh, they only build 110s and 112s in this cell. And it's pretty amazing that we are able to sell so many 110s and 112s every year. Let's go ahead and take a look. So each process is uh, divided up into uh, the little pieces that need to go together to build this knife. So what happens first is the knives get built, and then they get riveted, and then they get sanded, and then they get polished, and then they come out and they get edged and sharpened and a final polish. Every single knife that comes out of the Buck Knives factory, whether it's a thousand dollar knife or a twenty dollar knife, has the same level of attention to edging and sharpening. The first step is the operator will run the knife on the uh, abrasive wheel and get the edge on it. The next step is a gray wheel to run that burr down to nothing. And then the final step is a leather strop to put the, that super nice edge on it. And every single knife that comes out of here has that hand sharpening done to it. You can see on here that they're pretty sharp. It just has to touch that piece of paper and it goes right through. So, inside this bag is probably 500 pounds of sheds. We buy these, we buy about 10 bags a year of elk sheds. 
These are collected at the Elk Reserve Preserve over by uh, Grand Tetons National Park. The Boy Scouts collect these and then they sell them off at auction. We go through a lot of elk. We have elk on a lot of our premium products. You can go on our website and order a 110 with elk. You can order a 112 with elk. There's a lot of things we use elk for. In fact, not, very little of this goes to waste. Even the tips that are not very great for, uh, for handles become a handle for a marshmallow stick or a beer bottle opener or fire starter. So uh, we're all into the elk for sure. First thing that happens is that the elk gets shaved down into slab. The slab then gets marked out for the handle of the knife. Then uh, they get mated up. And they start to get polished. That's going to be a, a handle for a, a chef's knife of our kitchen cutlery line. Very, very popular to have the kitchen cutlery with elk handles on it. So here we are in the Cerakote room. Uh, this year, Buck Knives added Cerakote to our in-house capabilities here in the factory. And we're now able to put a premium coating on anything that we'd like to. Over here, I'd like to show you some of the colors, some of the options that we've been looking at for our Buck Knives. Uh, anything that you can think of. The great thing about Cerakote is that it's just like going to Sherwin-Williams, you can get almost any color you want. Uh, but it's much better than paint because it is a ceramic coating that's baked onto the knives, it actually adheres to the metal, and provides that superior abrasive resistance and corrosion resistance that we want for the product. Uh, anyone who's been uh, familiar with Cerakote in the, in the firearms industry will recognize its, its properties and what it actually does for you for the product. We're very pleased and proud to be able to offer this to our customers in a variety of options. Cerakote is uh, vastly superior to Hydro Dip and other coatings that we're going to find for knives. And you're going to see it come out on more and more products and buy. So one of the things that we did when we brought in Cerakote is so we bought the application robot as well. Uh, typical in knife making, you have a lot of parts that have to stack up and function together properly and when we're adding Cerakote to that we're adding a thickness to certain parts. So if we don't account for that, that can be a problem when things go together. The nice thing about the robot is that we can control exactly the thickness of the, of the Cerakote that's applied to any one particular part. Whereas hand spraying you might be anywhere from two thousandths to seven thousandths. We know with the robot that we are exactly at one thousandths thick of Cerakote on the part. It makes a big difference when we're putting things together and trying to make sure our engineering is correct. Bob Taylor approached us and said, hey, we got a lot of extra parts and pieces. How about we make ebony sides for Buck, go back to real wood again? He said, hey, that sounds like a great idea. So you can see here, this is a real nice looking piece of wood. It's been uh, milled out for the button for the 112 Auto. So it's just uh, really a great solid piece of wood. The whole relationship with Taylor is just another layer on our conservation message. We're working to conserve materials that we're using in our knives as well as conserve the species that we hunt and that we enjoy uh, getting after as well as just being out in the woods. That's a whole conservation effort too. We used to have all our wood handles made outside and we would get them in and they'd be out of spec or they'd be warped or something wrong with them so we brought these machines in now we cut all our wood handles inside. We only make what we want, when we want, and we control every last uh, detail. So it's always a good product. Our knife CNC area, we have about 25 machines. We just looked at screw machines and we looked at uh, machines making handles. Now we're in the heart of CNC. One thing that's really critical when you're milling out parts is you want to make sure those parts are accurate. It costs a lot of money to run a department like this and if you make bad parts, well, you're just throwing money away. So what we like to do, what we've employed, is the visual measuring system. What this does is allows the operator to run a part, come over here, put it on this uh, device here, the device will measure it and tell the operator, is that part in spec? here on this screen that the part they just checked, they're all okay. 
means that they did a good job. So if you're familiar with the 110 Auto, came out last year, it's essentially a regular 110 that we modify via an automatic. You see here I'm holding the brass bolsters. Forrest here has been working really hard, uh, carving in all the details that the mechanism will rest in, and then uh, all the, the added details on the front for the, for the button to work. Again, critical that we do this on a milling machine. There's no way we could do this uh, in traditional centering or uh, forming. It all has to be cut and spent. This machine here, this great big machine, when you look at that, you don't really think knife making. This looks like something you might find in some industrial site somewhere, NASA, whatever. But it's a really critical piece of machinery to make a knife. What this does is it filters from all the coolant that we use in the grinding operations, filters out all of the grinding dust, filters out all of the metal dust. We make knives out of stainless steel. A big component of stainless steel is chromium. Chromium is uh, classified as a toxic waste. So we have to collect it and, to, and dispose of it properly, and that's what this machine does. We put this in, we upgraded this machine from our prior machine this year, and uh, it's really been a great thing. It's helped us to, to speed up grinding and make sure we're doing it right. But more importantly, we've not had an incident where toxic materials have gotten away from us. So because of a machine like this, we're able to always be on top of what we're doing in this factory so we can say that we're an environmentally friendly factory. Uh, where we are right now is we have special room that we use to generate nitrogen. These machines are taking normal air from outside and refining it. Normal air outside is 70 plus percent nitrogen and the rest is oxygen and other things. It's refining that air and generating pure nitrogen. That nitrogen then is going into the laser room that we just saw that's helping to shield the laser as it's cutting the material. It's also going into heat treat, which we'll go take a look at here and you being used as the uh, quench curtain. So we're, we do a quench on our heat treat of pure nitrogen and uh, that uh, provides the ability to take the temperature down from that high temp to a, a lower temp quickly without having to put it in water or something. Behind us is the heat tunnel, and uh, heat treat can be a very complex process, but if you want to think about it simply, it's basically time and temperature. So the amount of time something is in the heat is important, and what that temperature is is important. This belt behind us right here, you can see, is moving very, very slowly. Uh, that belt actually is controlling the time that the product will be in the heat. So that's what we're using to control our time. Uh, this whole tunnel right here is divided up into sections. Each one of those sections, we can control the temperature. So between the time that's on the belt and the temperature of every section, we're basically heat treating the knife. Now what happens in the, in the process of heat treating is very interesting. We're not changing the dimensions of the product. We're not changing the chemistry of the product. We're just changing how the molecules of the product are aligned and combined. If we were to take a cross-section of, of one of these knives and look at it under a, a very powerful microscope, we would be able to see the grain structure. And that grain structure would be very random. As it comes off from the mill, very random, very big. Kind of like I, I used to, I like to talk about it being looking like river rock. Big boulders, small boulders, very random. As it's going through the process, we're taking that grain structure and making it very uniform. We're breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces until they're all the same size, all lined up in a lattice. In general, in knife making, you can say that your product is only as sharp as your biggest grains in the, in the material, in the metal. So the smaller the grain structure is, the more refined it is, the sharper the knife is going to be. So this is just kind of the end of the process. This is our store we actually do retail out of. So you can come in and you can buy any one of the knives that we make. You can come in and order a knife. You can get some apparel or some accessories. So we're, uh, we've got plans of eventually knocking out this wall and the next wall and, and putting it to the front of the, 
of the business so that you can just walk straight into the store without going through the lobby. Uh, so eventually this will probably be about twice as big, which, I mean, we barely cover any of the product that we uh, actually manufacture in this store. So you can come in and ask for it and we can go into the back and get it. But otherwise, uh, it's just limited space right now until we're able to knock out those walls.